if you can save three hours, four hours of labor a day, that's money back in your pocket to do some other things that are more revenue producing. Welcome to the High Voltage Business Builders, a show where we interview entrepreneurs growing and scaling their income through e-commerce and showing you the path to make your first or next million. All right, Manish, thanks for joining the call, my friend, from Connecticut today. How are things out there on the East Coast for you? Things are a bit cloudy here, but uh, it's a still a great day, and thank you for having me, Neil. Yeah, it's great to have you here, man. So we're talking a little bit about things um, that are obviously relevant to e but in different channels, not just Amazon. I know you handle multi-channel fulfillment. Let's talk a little bit about that because I know that's a, it's a big piece of what you do in your business model. Tell us, you know, what are you seeing? What's most relevant right now if someone's listening to this and they've got a drop shipping or an Amazon store or some other thing else? What's something they should know right now that you feel is important for them to hear? Well, one of the things that I just got back from Surge Summit last week, you know, you hear conflicting set of information, right? I mean, Amazon is rolling out new services. You brought up a little bit, a little, a little while earlier, Amazon warehouse and distribution. So mm -hmm. they're ready to take on everything. And then I hear from a very large seller, very successful seller just two days ago that their inventory limit has been cut to one third, you yes. know, <laughs> so. Yeah, so, we're here in that dream. Yeah, one side, you know, Amazon is ready to take on everything you've got. And the second side is, you know, the people that are in need of that inventory today don't have that. So, you know, Amazon has different teams working. You know, you really can't believe one thing or the other because they're yeah. all <laughs> just simply trying to get, you know, in the limelight. So it's, it's a lot of confusion out there for sellers. Yeah, there is definitely because they said we're going to do 5% of you only or we're going to get this cut, right? We're going to have to make some holiday changes. We got inventory issue. Now, if I just look at our group, our businesses, and, and we come back, there was more than 5% of the people in our group who got that notification just within our group. So I'm like, well, I don't think that was quite 5%. I think they kind of just placated those numbers just a little bit. So they killed it on one end by having down the, the shelving space we had on one side of the house. And then they say, hey, well, we got this new Amazon warehouse distribution AWD thing, and you can have unlimited storage over here all of a sudden. And it's kind of like, well, I mean, are we playing the shifting shelves game here? What do you think is going on? Well, I mean, again, Amazon is a very large company. They're different product owners. Each one has their own agenda, you know, so they may have gotten certain amount of space allocated. You know, there's also Amazon launched uh, Buy with Prime service that is probably also run by a separate group that they're ready to take on fulfillment for Shopify merchants or just about anyone. So it is very unnerving if you're a seller like yourself or, you know, people in your group, that if you see your inventory limits cut down, you know, what confidence, what trust would you have in other services? So one thing that we, you know, at Kahoot, we like to, you know, educate our sellers or give them advice that you've got to have a backup and it cannot be Amazon. Amazon cannot be Amazon's backup. You've got to have an independent third party that has your interest in mind that is going to help you navigate the turbulent Amazon waters. And that's not going to end anytime soon. It's not yeah. a Q4 issue. It's not a Q1 issue. Yeah. As long as you play in the Amazon ecosystem, that will continue to remain a challenge, no matter how large, how many services they roll out. Yeah, it's a very valid point. And I, and I love the way you speak, Manish, because you're a very pragmatic guy. I can tell in the way that you, you look at these things, because obviously adding with the buy with Prime is on, uh, excuse me, buy with Prime button. I can say that wrong. Prime is on. I came up with something new. Look at that. It's added on a whole additional line of sellers from Shopify and other stuff, which I don't know if they were aware maybe of what that would do. I know a lot of people have suddenly implemented that. I know for sure they're going to take over a lot of Shopify's opportunity for marketplace delivery. They were trying to bring up, I think they what they killed most recently, about 10,000 people in there across their divisions, if I remember correctly. Well, uh, but uh, Shopify just came out uh, last week, I think, and uh, banned. So Shopify has publicly gone and gone on record to say that installing the buy with prime button is against Shopify's terms of service. So there you have it, you know, Shopify yep. ban, wants to ban buy with prime, buy with prime, you know, uh, wants to get on Shopify, you know, nobody wants to take FBA forwarding, yeah. you know, it's a big challenge. If you're a seller, you know, you just cannot be beholden yep. to any platform centric fulfillment option. And there it is, right? So we talk about pros and cons, and we're very open about both of those things as Amazon. We don't want people to be Amazon channel locked. Like, so you need to move a brand beyond Amazon if you start there and incubate it. Or if you're off Amazon, you obviously you need the combination of the multi-channel aspect really for e-com today. But like you said, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. And as soon as you have the opportunity to split out profits, you should move another channel, another opportunity. I didn't actually not hear that update on Shopify. So that's interesting news. I'm going to go look that up. 
I can see why they would do it. The marketplace is getting extremely competitive and that opportunity was going to cut into their their delivery systems they were trying to ramp up. Well, it's not uh, even delivery system. It cuts into the heart of the revenue. Well, so, for sure, for sure. Uh, it makes a lot of knowledge. Yeah, I mean, you can see why we do these kinds of things and have these kind of conversations. If you're out here just trying to flounder around on your own, for us, if, if having the experiences levels we do and, and you too, it's it's even confusing at times to try to rationalize this stuff in the middle of all the experience we have versus people who are just trying to get going. So if you're new and you're it's like, okay, I got an Amazon channel. I don't necessarily have a 3PL yet, or I'm looking to get one. What are like the top three things you want people to know when they're looking for a 3PL company that they should consider? What are the, what are the things they should know about it? First and foremost, I think it's very important to make data-driven decisions. A lot of sellers just simply reach out to 3PLs and we get many of those inquiries. Give me a price rate card. You know, yeah. your rate card is not, most 3PLs specialize in something. Not everyone specializes in everything. You know, there's micro, what we call mom and pop 3PLs. These are one location, two location, 3PLs. And then there are chains and, and then you have networks like Kahoot. So, you know, it's very important to understand the 3PLs should understand what kind of products are they going to deal with? What's the inbound and outbound frequency? What kind of services you're expecting? You know, what is most important to you if you're simply looking for an FBA forwarding service? Or are you looking for DTC fulfillment? What kind of products? Because there's the shipping cost. So for example, I'll give you a very simple example. You can get dirt cheap fulfillment. Let's just say, even in the hottest market, Southern California, let's say dirt cheap storage. But if most of your orders are going to New York or the East Coast, you're going to pay zone eight shipping prices for moving that item from California to New yeah. York on an individual yeah. basis. So net net, you actually will lose money even though you thought you got a great deal. You know, those are things very important. If the 3PL is going to take one or two days extra to ship from a, a lead time, or, you know, if they're going to use downgraded services that will take longer for the consumer to receive, all of those things are very important to understand upfront as to what are you trying to solve for. And that is one thing that is very important, at least at Kahoot, we don't blindly hand out pricing because we don't know if we are going to be the best fit and only information and data tells us whether we're going to be the right fit. So I would encourage sellers to really, you know, how many SKUs, what kind of orders are you fulfilling, the count of orders, let's do last six to 12 months of averages to make sure, you know, what's the typical inventory storage requirement? How long do you store that inventory for? And having all that information and what the shipping cost is going to be because many 3PLs do not, you know, they charge a shipping cost so you could lose a lot of money on that front. And how does it compare to FBA? Trying to make any comparison for, with FBA so you know exactly on for what products you're going to come out ahead, what products are going to cost more. Because, you know, we, we got to admit, you know, FBA is very competitive for small and light, mm, very attractive. So yeah. anybody who tells you they're going to beat FBA prices across the board, they're most likely lying. Yeah, because of this infrastructure, their multi-channel services usually can win to some degree. You just have to look at it from a strategic perspective and not the lowest race to the bottom pricing, because I know that's what happens to a lot of those people with rate cards is they're selling, you know, $10, $12 products and they've got razor thin margins. And it's hard to beat Amazon's FBA pricing at that level because they're already razor thin and, and Amazon's trying to beat all the competition for pricing. So you got to be, you know, smart about your numbers. And, and usually people who are just asking for rate cards don't really know what their numbers are and they may not even know what zone eight means. <laughs> They're listening to this, right? But guys, by the way, that's the like the farthest distance from one location to another and shipping costs. If you've ever tried to ship something and like U.S. Postal Service, go down and look, they have a zone card and you'll, and you'll notice some of the locations are some of the farthest away and you got to be smart about where your sales are coming from. If you're on DTC, it's a little easier. You can kind of do a quick analysis and see where's the majority of my orders going to from people who are buying. On Amazon, you got to wait a little bit and figure out where Amazon's distribution is sending all your products into which areas uh, you're getting the most sales from, which may take a little bit of time for, from the system. But obviously, manage you know your stuff. I mean, I'm just listening to you for the last five minutes, you clearly understand this. Where, what is your background in this business model? Yeah, so I was involved with building the e-commerce e -commerce platform before the word e-commerce platform was invented. You know, I've been an old school now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is uh, going back to early 2000. I yeah. was involved with building one of the first, uh, we used to call it shopping cart software back then, turnkey shopping cart software, long before Shopify existed. Magento wasn't on, on the market at that time. So built 
a very successful shopping cart software, turnkey e-commerce platform, as we call, uh, as we see now. So I've seen e-commerce evolve from its infancy and then went on to build another similar product, but it's a full service mid-market e-commerce order management system, inventory management system. So I've been dealing with online retailers, technologies, God, for, you know, 22 plus years. So I've seen everything and just about anything. I've got deep experience with now logistics. Uh, I've got 10 U.S. patents on business process orchestration and collaboration. So a lot of experience in anything and everything to do with e-commerce and operations. Yeah, no, that's a very historic background. I mean, back to 2000 is post.com bubble. Did you get out of the bubble somehow and into this or did you ride, did you ride that out okay or what happened there? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think we did phenomenally well because that was the time when e-commerce was just taking off. And I think yep. some of the large, the e-toys of the world, they pretty much laid the foundation for the SMBs. You know, SMBs were getting on for the very first time, you know, yeah, just yeah. like the pandemic did brought in a ton of people who started to sell online. But in this case, there were businesses that were offline, the brick and mortar that suddenly saw themselves as an opportunity to sell online. And this is actually, I think this was before Amazon opened itself up as a marketplace. So this is yeah. Amazon marketplace did not exist. Yahoo shopping used to be the marketplace. Right. May or may not remember right. that. No, I do. But the eToys thing is taking me back in my brain for a second. I'm over here, Bram and I haven't heard eToys in a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So th those were those were the early days of seeing yeah, no the, the evolution of that. So, yeah, I mean, you know, every time there's a crisis, as they say, or there's a challenge, there's an opportunity. I mean, right now, right. you know, we're going through some historic, you know, black swan event with the pandemic and so on. But I think there are some great businesses that are going to emerge out of this. You know, I mean, yes. for my own business, which is Kahoot, it's a innovative peer-to-peer -peer order fulfillment network. You know, for the very first time, if you're a merchant who has a warehouse, you have an opportunity to make money if you have excess space in your warehouse. You know, this is something that did not exist, similar to what Uber and Airbnb did in 2008 when the fi financial crisis hit. All of a sudden, people were without jobs, so they were going and signing up to become drivers for Uber, which allowed Uber to offer low prices for short-term transportation, which really helped them take off. Similarly, Airbnb also emerged during that time when people were trying to save on short-term stays. They don't want to pay large you know, heavy amounts to the Hiltons and the Marriott's yep. of the world. Yep. And, and there was a great opportunity for them to monetize their spare bedroom. And so Kahoot is doing something very similar in the fulfillment and logistics space. So if you have a warehouse and you have your act together and you've got spare capacity for the very first time, you can come to Kahoot, join our network and apply to become a fulfillment partner and make some money. So peer-to-peer -peer fulfillment network. That's a new, that's very innovative. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah well, obviously, your innovations and, and patents and other things have led you to some really new concepts. Where do you see that moving in the next year with some of the challenges, the fulfillment, longer shipping times? Where do you see that going? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that merchant, uh, the fulfillment companies or merchants should be embracing what I call merchant inclusive fulfillment. You know, if you think about a merchant's needs, right? A merchant wants to bring in inventory, whether it's domestically or international. The inventory is going to come into one of the one of the bigger ports. There are some of the uh, less popular ports that I recommend right now. If you're having trouble getting inventory to Long Beach or Oakland, and New York, New Jersey, you can look into Charleston, you can look into Miami, you can look into some of the other ports that are less congested. I mean, I, I think merchants want a single provider that can handle their B2B, that they, they can stage their inventory, you know, and then drip it to FBA as needed for the items that make sense. They can send, they can do the fulfillment for other channels, Shopify. Walmart, others. I know Walmart launched this uh, Walmart Fulfillment Services. A lot yes. of sellers are not super excited about that. It's uh, They still right. find that to be in, in early stages and in infancy in its technology evolution. So yeah. if you have a warehouse, you know, the people are going and rushing to build new warehouses, but we believe that there are 2 million merchants in the U.S. Many of them do fulfillment on of their own, that there's plenty of capacity available, just like how Airbnb helped unlock millions of rooms as opposed to going out and building new hotels in an already crowded space, which, you know, when somebody builds a very expensive warehouse, you know, they're going to charge you something very expensive for their services because they got to recover their expenses. Right. So Kahoot is very yeah. unique in that way to leverage existing assets 
so that we can get higher utilization from what already exists. Fantastic, man. And if I'm not wrong, it's Kahoot.ai. Is that correct? Kahoot.ai. Yes. Okay. And when they show up, what should uh, what should they expect to, to give you to get kind of the right information necessary? And we're, we're talking about sellers who are already in the marketplace in one capacity channel or another, but we're also talking about those who have additional warehouse space, maybe even other 3PLs who might want to utilize that space, if I'm hearing you correctly, can connect with you as well. Is that right? That's right. We have two parts of our network. The sellers that are looking to outsource fulfillment, they can come to Kahoot. And if they have, you know, it, it's always a good idea once a year to evaluate existing. If you have a great deal, you know, come out to Kahoot. Let us reconfirm that you still have a great deal. You know, no harm done. It's uh, something to be aware of. Or if you have one location, you want to add a second location because you're getting orders from nationwide. We have the technology, the software that can make that happen seamlessly. And if you're super happy with your existing provider, we're not looking to replace them or displace them. That's just not the way how Kahoot operates. We would invite them to come join the Kahoot network so they can participate and they can stay part of it. Because if you've got a good thing going, we, you know, we have the technology to glue it all together. And on the supply side, as a, if you're a warehouse that has excess capacity that you want to monetize, then you come join and apply to become a fulfillment partner. And we invite three PLs as well to come join as a fulfillment partner because let's face it, let's say you are a new East Coast based three PL, your customers, your merchants are demanding a location on the West Coast. So rather than losing that client entirely, you can come and partner with somebody so you can keep that client and meet that client's needs. Because if you choose to ignore that client's needs, because to your point, Neil, zone eight, shipping from New York to California is zone eight, that's very expensive. However, you slice it. And yep. even if your fulfillment provider's rates are the cheapest, you're still going to come out in the red because shipping orders cross country has two problems, higher shipping cost and longer transit time. It takes five days for the, for the item to be delivered, sometimes could be up to six, seven days. So we invite both 3PLs and warehouses of capacity to come check us out, apply to become a fulfillment partner, and for the sellers to look out and find a merchant-inclusive fulfillment. You know, you got to have a backup. And I'm talking about the seller, Neil, that I spoke with last week. They're mm -hmm. one of the top sellers in, in the Amazon space. They are plugged in. You know, they're super smart. You know, you, you would know them. You know, even they don't have a backup. And that is, it's appalling to me that how can you put all the eggs in one basket? You get to be a certain size, risk management needs to be a big part of your operational component. <laughs> I would be surprised that they didn't have some of that in place, but I'm sure they could help you. Man, this is, you, you're obviously got an innovative, unique idea for both seller and 3PL. And folks, if you're listening to this, I would encourage you to check it out. The link will be in the show notes. Go to Kahoot.ai, check out what Mamish is doing. Obviously, you can hear he's a super smart guy who's figured something out. That's a really cool, it will benefit both you and the 3PL provider you might be using at this point. Guys, I would encourage you to go check it out and take a look at that if both, again, you're a seller and a 3PL. Manish, any other final words of wisdom you want to leave on us today? Thank you, Neil. I mean, there's one more thing in the words of Steve Jobs. You know, We also, Kahoot has the industry leading shipping software. So if you are not ready to outsource fulfillment and you have a warehouse, you do fulfillment or shipping yourself, you know, Kahoot can save you a lot of time in rate shopping. You know, we did a side-by-side -side comparison between ShipStation and Kahoot, which is a leading product on the market. Yeah. And, you know, of course, as they say, when, you know, Kahoot came out 21 times faster, you know, that's just the technology that Kahoot has built that reduces human error. It reduces, you know, a human trying to compare UPS, FedEx, USPS rates, figuring out, you know, which one to pick. And rather than doing it one order at a time or applying any kind of crude rules, Kahoot's technology automates all of it. So if you want many hours back in your day, and I kid you not, we have a client that was spending four hours on a Sunday away from their family printing labels so that they could ship those orders out on Monday. Mm. And they could not fulfill Monday's orders until Tuesday because you know, they just did not have the capacity. And yeah. so there's some unique technology even on the shipping software front, that's why I would encourage, you know, yeah. you reduce your labor. If you can save three hours, four hours of labor a day, if you can that's save money back in your three pocket hours, to four do hours some of other labor things a that day, are more revenue producing. that's money back in your pocket very smart. to and, do and some other things that are more that, revenue definitely. producing. So a shipping station comparison is a very good analogy for what your software does. And, and obviously it's very powerful. We may have to check that out ourselves for some of the projects we're working on. Thanks for bringing that up, man. I appreciate your time today, sir.
Thank you, Neil. Anything else you'd like to cover or, um, you know? No, look, that's good for me at this point, unless you have something else you would like us to know. No, I mean, I think just uh, merchants should be aware that Amazon has asked, F FBA has added peak fulfillment surcharge of 6 to 8% for the very first time. That's, I that think, coming, getting rolled out on October 15th. That's the fourth increase in FBA fees this year. February yes. 1, they announced, uh, previously announced uh, charges. I think in the first quarter, they revamped the uh, small and light pricing. April 28, they added 5% inflation surcharge. And then, of course, the storage triples in Q4, as you know. So I would encourage sellers to go check out their bills and to make sure that, you know, nothing in the Amazon FBA world remains as is. So be mindful of that as you're ca calculating your profitability, how much you're allocating to, to your advertising, return on advertising spend and all that good stuff. So, and some other big news, right? I mean, PharmaPak's the number one Amazon seller going out of business, you know, la mm, last- Big one. Yeah, yes. their margins were too thin. And I was just going to cover a little bit of that, actually, because on the antithesis side of that, one of the th third largest native acquisitions just occurred for the cosmetics company, a $630 million acquisition. So on the other side, you got to look at the differences between the two. Why did one go out of business and why did one have such a tremendous exit? And then how to deal with the rising costs of obviously inflation or fees, obviously, as you mentioned, are going up. And that's a good topic because, I mean, you got to look at the value of the brand and the value of the product you're putting into it. That's one of the things we always drive out here. If you're going to sell something for $30 or less on Amazon, you better have a very high margin on it or not sell anything less than $30, or you're going to run into these kinds of really razor thin margins where you might be making it great or your cost is good and the product is growing, but all of a sudden that 5% surcharge or changes at this qu uh, fourth quarter of the year, you know, slice your margins down to like a dollar in profit, which is really no <laughs> for a business model. <laughs> so I want to encourage everybody on the back of that to remember, keep your product profitability above 10, if if not higher to $15 in net profit per unit for your products. If you can't achieve that on your products, currently you need to get products in the market that will do that. That will raise with price, can raise retail price against inflation and market hedges, or of course, increasing costs and operations and logistics, as we just spoke about, won't impact you as greatly. Yes, they'll impact you, but it won't be devastating. And I know there's a lot of sellers in the market right now that are going to face that coming into fourth quarter. As we mentioned earlier, there's opportunity in everything. For some of us, there's going to be great opportunity priced correctly and in the profit margins we need where fourth quarter this year is going to be great. But I think there are going to be a lot of sellers who are coming off of a COVID bump uh, who still have a right size their metrics or expectations and rising costs of inflation are going to are going to hurt them in this coming quarter. And many of them may not be able to make it through the end of the fourth quarter, even though they should be doing really well. Right. And, and uh, business uh, metrics have changed, right? I mean, if you're looking to get acquired by the likes of Thrasios in the world, right, they're having massive challenges of their own. You know, yes. I think profitability is going to be key and re-examining all your numbers carefully. The other advice that we're giving sellers is don't, don't wait to wait for the last minute. Holiday shopping is going to happen earlier. There's, of course, a lot of talk about uh, second Prime Day. I mean, just think about it. Why is Amazon you know, considering a second prime day is because they want to push holiday forward. They want to push spending forward so that, you know, they've got tons of excess inventory. We've, we've heard from Walmart, you know, lots of inventory challenges, you know, discounting, aggressive discounting happening at Target. You know, they, they, their profit plummeted 90%, 89.9% yeah, year. Target's taking a big hit, no doubt. Yeah. yeah, and you mentioned Walmart because just recently, I, I literally yesterday, I saw an article that said Walmart re removed some of the major restrictions that was making it very difficult for third-party sellers to get approved on their platform. And in one day, they had the largest spike in signups they've had to date since they opened the Walmart platform because now you can actually get over there and open up your business, which is your name and your business and, and a few other details now, whereas before it was highly restrictive. So there may be some additional opportunity for folks looking at Walmart because it has a, a you know market potential opportunity. But you're right. There are others that are, they're suffering for a lot of different reasons. You bring up Target, but Target's isn't just operational or profitability. They've got other geo and political problems hitting them due to some policies and stuff that affected them, I believe. Just look at the market and the trends and you can see what I'm talking about. But in terms of market share and stuff, the latest studies show that even Walmart and Target combined still don't make up Amazon's 38% of market share. So if you're going to play in the market, go with the juggernaut, right? Certainly, certainly, but also diversify, you know, because yep. anything that you can, if you're successful at one marketplace, you want to dip your toe in the other. Hence the Walmart point. You can get into Walmart a lot easier now due yep. to those restrictions of being lifted. Yep. So you should definitely consider it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Manish, thank you so much for your time, sir. Neil, thank you again for having me and uh, pleasure, uh, pleasure speaking to your audience. And if I can be of any help, please go check us out at www.kahoot.ai. 
If you like this episode, please share it with people you think will enjoy it as well. Thank you for listening and be sure to tune in next week for a brand new episode of High Voltage Business Builders. 